Chief, thank you for your testimony. I think it's uh, very important uh, that you note that uh, every budget is a moral document. I would say every law is uh, related to something moral or some moral precept uh, in some way or another. Um, but you also say that the taxes we pay are the price that we pay for a good society. Do we pay as members of society anything else for a good society? Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Wardlow, I think it's all about our, our life work and our roles as citizens and the way that we contribute to community through our work and, uh, and our volunteerism and the taxes we pay and the gifts we make and the way we reach out to one another. I, I would say that government is just one way that we enhance the caring that we show for one another, but it's an important and indispensable device. Representative Wardlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Rucci. So, the government, as you said, is only is, is one factor in creating a good society. Um, is it better than if you're trying to create a good society for uh, an impersonal bureaucracy to take care of the needs of uh, your neighbor or a family member or perhaps the neighbors and family members surrounding that person with needs? Mr. Rushi. Well, Mr. Chairman and Representative Wardlow, I think when, when any human being sees another person in trouble or in pain or, 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 or sick, we reach out. Um, and, uh, and there's something absolutely moral about that. Um, that charitable impulse to be kind to one another is, is pretty much the glue that holds us together. But there's a matter of justice, too. And it's, an, it's not a good thing to change institutional arrangements to the extent that you have more and more people desperate so that people that are advantaged can be kind. I mean, I think you need to ask the question about who is that arrangement really for? Justice, I would argue, is, is you know, is a, is a very elusive goal. But that doesn't mean we should shirk from the pursuit of a situation where more people live in the mainstream, shop at Cub, don't go to the food shelf, sleep at home, not in the church basement. I think we need to pay a lot of attention to that. Person Wardlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Rushi, have you considered how taking $4 billion out of the private sector and putting it into the hands of bureaucrats and politicians to spend through government programs might stifle innovation? and uh, st cause uh, stagnation with regard to innovation, the kind of innovation, um, kind of free enterprise uh, that uh, is uh, personified by a couple of the testifiers that were here before, Ms. Hasser, Roca, and Ms. Berg. Um, and would you deny them fruits of their labors and the societal goods that they talked about? Mm, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Representative Wardlow, if I thought $4 billion was being wasted, I would totally agree with you. Um, but. We have in Minnesota a track record of, in general, since, the, since, since World War II, of outperforming the nation in terms of per capita income growth, unemployment, business location, business growth, all kinds of good economic indicators because we've been a fairly high tax, high service state and we've invested in our people in important ways and that um, has actually given many of us um, a platform, and, and I didn't even mention higher ed, excuse me, higher ed, commitment to higher ed, commitment to K-12. That's given us a platform for a lot of families to do real well. And I just don't, I just don't think of government bureaucracy as an, as an empty black box. I think this state, and I've lived in other states, I've lived in two other states. We've done things well here. And my concern is that um, we keep tearing it down and we've got a strong argument to make for how this can be the best workforce in the nation and the best place to do business. And I think we should stop tearing it down. Representative Wardlow. One final follow-up question then, uh, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Rushi. Have you ever studied or uh, considered or, or done any analysis of how increasing uh, expenditures on government programs uh, to serve those with needs and um, through welfare programs, health care, et cetera, 
whether and how it corresponds to private donations to charities that serve those same functions. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it maybe the level of, oh, please. Maybe I can clarify. Mr. Wardlaw. Have you ever considered or, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Rucci. Uh, have you ever considered or analyzed the question of whether increasing revenues spent on um, government programs uh, affects or uh, causes donations to private charities serving similar functions to decrease or increase? Mr. Rushy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll have to pass on that. I, I don't know that that is a relationship that I've looked so at. So you've not looked at that question? I can give you anecdotal, I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Rushy. I can give you anecdotal evidence of a place where maybe public expenditures have have started at something in a nonprofit which attracts philanthropic dollars to make something happen. I can also think of the reverse where the philanthropic community has said, hey, let's go in this area and see if we can do something about housing or something. and then. And then the public sector goes, oh, we've got a nice piece of infrastructure coming out of the nonprofit sector. You know, let's put our piece in. I mean, I think that Minnesota probably, because we have a fairly enlightened civic sector, probably does more of that sort of synergy between nonprofit and public sector than most other places. It's been pretty healthy by and large. I think we, you know, we really look to each other for, for opportunities and advantage to leverage dollars and make things happen. Mr. Representative Wardlow. I'm sorry, just one thing you said sparked one additional question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Rusey. Um, you said that we have a relatively enlightened civic, I assume you're saying public sector. Mm -hmm. Do you trust this enlightened public sector more than you trust the people that elected them? Mr. Rushy? Well, I guess I would, I would say that uh, that this problem, this $6.2 billion problem is so big that it's going to take everybody pulling oars in the same direction, public sector, private sector, whatever. Uh, and I hope we trust each other. You know, you're the manifestation of, um, of the electorate. Um, the governor's budget, I think, is a manifestation of the electorate. And I'm mindful of the fact that 56% of the public, of the, of the voting public, voted for governor candidates that said they were going to have to raise taxes to meet this, this hole. Both candidate Horner and candidate Dayton said that, and they, together, I think it was 56. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to parse this too much other than to say we've got to all be part of the solution. And, um, you know, we've already seen how the, the Dayton proposal is going to land pretty tough on low-income people. There's a lot of painful cuts in there. Um, anyway, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Thank you. Okay, Wardlow. Nope, no further. Okay, we have.